Today I'm joined by Cranberries guitarist Noel Hogan and drummer Fergal Lawler. Uh, thanks, thanks for being here, guys. Thank, Thank you. you. Welcome to Toronto. Thanks Cheers. very much. Nice, nice to have you here. Um, I, I, I don't. I'm going to start with the hard stuff off the bat. Hmm. I think because I'm, I'm trying to figure out how to talk about some of this. So, Noel, I'll go to you first. I know when I'm experiencing grief, it's hard to do anything. Mm. So, tell me a little bit about why you wanted to finish or, or make this record. Um, I guess there was a there was a combination of things. One. We listened, when we sat down and listened to the songs back to back, we put them, you know, we put the demos together and made up a kind of a playlist. And then you kind of go, hold on a minute, this is actually, it's better than a normal Cranberries album even, we felt. There was just something about it, there was something there that we felt that it was something Doris would want to do. Because I had been talking to her literally up until, you know, almost the day before she passed away. And it was all excitement about this album, about getting in to record it. So it felt like you were doing some kind of injustice by not finishing it. Mm. Um, so we listened to it together and then we knew, you know, we'd have to speak to the family, see how they felt about it. If they didn't want us to do it, we wouldn't have. Um, but they were actually delighted to hear that we were going to do it because Doris had shared her enthusiasm with them as well. So that helped, um, I think... We knew what we had, as in we knew we had the vocals were good enough to use, the songs were good enough. Um, and once we had their blessing, really, it was a matter of just the last piece of the puzzle was to, we rang Stephen Street, who's been our longtime producer, and he was on board when he heard the songs as well. And it, I think looking back now, it was, I guess, a, a form of therapy for us as well. You think so? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I do. Because I can't imagine what we would have done individually if we hadn't this album to get us through the last year. What did it do for you? It 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 gave you a focus and a kind of a, a mission that you wanted to do this for Dolores to finish it, for the band to do her memory justice, things like that. Mm. Um, especially when you finish it and you go home and you live with it and you listen to it and you think, you know, and I know I mean, it's in an arrogant way, but you think this is an incredible piece of work mm -hmm. we have here. Yeah. Um, and to think that that could have been sitting on a hard drive on a shelf forever for no one to hear, you know, you, then you start to think, we definitely did the right thing. You know, I can only imagine, Fergal, like, I can imagine that, you know, when you make a record, well, I know when I make a record, I think about things like, you know, who's going to hear it? Is this going to do okay? You know, is this is this accurately, I feel the pressure, is this like, is this the best thing I could possibly make? Mm. But then I, I can only imagine, like, you know, the added pressure of the person who's singing these lyrics is so important to me, and with all yeah. respect, and she's gone now. That That's that's an added pressure it there is. as well. Yeah, but, but also... Uh, I think um, it kind of encourages us to do our best, you know, as if you'd be letting her down if you didn't give it everything. Because the first day of recording was really overwhelming emotionally and we were kind of all kind of moping around a bit, you know, and it was it was hard to, to get into it and to get focused. But I think once you realise that, look, this isn't going to do anyone any favours if we're moping around the place like this, we're not going to give... Our hundred percent to what we need to do here is to finish the work that Dolores started. So once we kind of got that focus in our mindset, you know, and kind of worked on our individual parts, and you know, thought of the bigger picture of this needs to be a really good quality, strong Cranberries album, you mm. know, rather than cobbled together bits and pieces of demos, you know, which that was the last thing anyone wanted. So let's let's take a listen to a little bit of it. Just take a listen to this. <coughs> That's all over now by the Cranberries. You're not wrong by it. It's really good. <laughs> Even listening to it there, I was like, that sounds great. You know, I'm still surprised. <laughs> it must be odd to hear her voice, though, when you were going through these demos, you know. Yeah, yeah. when you solo it up, you know, you're checking all the pieces and you're kind of patching bits here and there. And then you hit solo on the desk and it's like, oh, God. You know, it's just, there's a song on there called Lost. And I think it's the second song on the album. And... It's one of the ones she sounds really, really delicate in it. And it's very, you know, because it wasn't 
a kind of a Finnish vocal, but it has this charm or this kind of vulnerability to it that it was for me the hardest that I, like going through the demos before we ever went in the studio. I, I had to kind of walk away from it and come back to it a couple of times to check to get from beginning to end. And then funnily enough, when we actually started recording it together in the room, I think we all felt the same way. Um, no, it's a beautiful song and it, it ended up amazing. It's probably one of our favourites on there. But there are moments through the album that you just listen to her and you think, what was going on at that moment? How 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 rough were these demos? Like, what were you, you what were you using here? Uh, so a lot of it was done kind of back in track in Logic, and then sent to Dolores, and she was in her apartment in New York, in one of the room a bedroom or something like that, and she did these vocals. Mm. So she'd send the idea back then. And then there's other songs that she had worked on, actually a little bit here in Toronto. Um, because she was living here for mm-hmm. a while and she was be- between here and New York and uh, those ones were a bit more developed because they were ones she had herself so she had more time with them. Mm. So it was a kind of a, a mix of both types of songs. You know, Fergal, as, as Noel said just then, you know, what, what stuck with me, what you said was there were moments I was listening to her voice soloed mm-hmm. and... Um, and this, I, I, I'm asking this all as respectfully as I can. I yeah. understand this is, this is something you're going through. Um, but he said... I can only imagine what she was going through. Were there, were there ever moments when you were making this record that it seemed like it might be a little bit too much? No. I, I, I think um, once we... You know, because even before Dolores passed away, she was in quite a good place. I mean, th- th- they're, they're not all doom and gloom on this album. There's quite a few happy songs, you know, because she kind of had been through a divorce, which she was very open about, and she would struggled with... Um, her mental health and she was kind of getting on top of that she was you know getting therapy and had medication to kind of keep her, her balance more and she was in a good place you know she was feeling quite content um, and she was looking forward to a new new chapter of her life so we knew that you know she was feeling in, in a good place when she wrote the songs but she needed to get the bad memories out we'll mm-hmm. say and put them on paper mm-hmm. so I think once we got the first week done and we kind of realised, you know, this sounds really good. I mean, it sounds like a proper Cranberries album. We're doing the right thing here. So we kept going from there. If you're just tuning in, this is Q. I'm speaking with Noel Hogan and Fergal Lawler of the Cranberries about their final album, I could say, I suppose. Mm. Hey, Yeah. Um, in the end, featuring the voice of their lead singer, the late Dolores, Dolores O'Riordan. Yeah, for the final record, I suppose. Yeah, hey. yeah. It's not like a big discussion was had. We just knew we were going to do this and that was it then. Can we, can we go back a little bit, maybe, mm-hmm. to the early days? Like, when you first met Dolores, what, what do you remember about meeting her for the first time? Um, we met her through, we had a singer before Dolores for a brief spell, and uh, he was a good friend of ours as well. And he left, and we kind of had this, basically an instrumental band for a while. Um, we were writing songs that would become songs for that first Cranberries album. Right, because Linger was an it instrumental. It was floating around for a while, yeah, yeah. yeah. And... Um, we met Niall was this guy and Niall said, oh, my girlfriend knows a girl that is looking for a band that just wants to do originals like she does. So we were like, yeah, that's us. So mm. let her come on up. And we met her on a Sunday afternoon sometime in 1990. What do you think? <laughs> it was like she came in with this kind of shiny tracksuit on and she was tiny, uh, very shy, um, not at all the Dolores that the world got to know. And... Uh, we were like, does she want to be in a band kind of thing? But then, like, she opened her mouth and started to sing, and it was like, oh, God, this is unbelievable. And you kind of wonder, you know, why is she not already in a band or doing something? And, uh, yeah, I mean, it was just, it, it, that, that was the day we met, and it changed, like, little did we all know how much that would change all our lives, that day, the four of us meeting together. But um, it just, it grew and grew from that moment on. I mean, the Dolores' voice was so incredible, mm. you know. I, I, I think a lot about because I'm I, I I love your band and I also love traditional music from Ireland. That's what I that's what mm, yeah. I that's what I toured and played for a long time. And I, I heard like Sean No singing and I heard like traditional singing in her voice and I heard yeah. like a hard edge too in a in a grunge there. I'm Fergal, I'm gonna ask you to do something hard. Like how would you describe Dolores' voice? It's a mixture of things. She 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 um she played piano for a long time and sang in the choir and that and I remember she said her piano teacher tried to give her some vocal lessons once and kind of said, you can't do this, you can't do that. And she just rebelled against that straight away. I said, OK, I'm never going near another vocal coach or anyone like that because I can do whatever I want with my voice, you know. And that, that was what made her unique. I mean, she could had a massive range, but she had influences from 
opera to country music to she used to go and sing with the monks in Glenstall Abbey, which is, you know, what? it's like a yeah, Gregorian chanting and stuff. She'd like go that. sing with them, really? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then there was the, the Shan Noah uh, mm-hmm. traditional element, which she loved as well. Mm-hmm. You know, if we were in a bar after a gig or whatever, she'd start singing this old Irish song that no one ever knew, but it was just mm-hmm. amazing. You know? I, I also think her lyrics were incredible. Like she, she, she was writing about things that were happening in the world. She was writing about things that weren't necessarily, just like with that music teacher. Anything that touched her she'd write about, yeah. you know, whatever she felt, no matter, you know, she wouldn't consider the consequences of, oh, what if people are upset by this or that? Yeah. She'd just get it out. And it wasn't just about writing from her own experience and things she saw and love and all that stuff. She was writing about, I mean, you think about zombie. I mean, she was yeah. writing about... But that moved her. That, that was uh, when the child got killed. That was what really made her angry. Yeah. And I remember the day she came into, the, we were in a small little garage rehearsing and she kind of came in and said, look, I, I'm really angry about this. I want you to do something loud and angry and do you have any distortion pedals and hit the drums louder and that kind of thing, you know? Also not incredibly expected of her at the time, or especially of women <clears throat> in the music industry at that time <clears throat> either, you know? Yeah, I mean, for us, that was a completely different s- sound because we, we had Linger and Dreams were massive at that, you know, by the time Zombie came out. We had it a while, but, you know, nobody had heard that side of us really. Um, and then for, like, a, a, a female singer in the 90s to be that outspoken about things was it was kind of unheard of really mm-hmm. um so but everyone knew her when when people got to know how what she was like um you never know what to expect to come out of her really you know she just she felt about something she said it and didn't care so how did she deal i mean because you mentioned you were you know you, you go to a pub after the gig or you'd, you'd rehearse in a, in a small little garage or something like that but also Things got really, really, really big for you guys. Mm. You know, like, you know, millions of people around the world bought your debut album. Your songs are in movies and TV commercials. I'm in, like, you know, I'm in school and we can't escape mm-hmm. it, you know? I mean, how, how did Dolores deal with that kind of fame? It was harder for her than us. Is that so? Yeah. <clears throat> I mean, there was the initial, like, when we became big and, and for a little while when we went home, you know, people recognized you and kind of, but then people got used to seeing us around. But, Dolores being the only girl in the band and also the front person, there was that demand, more of a demand to kind of get more from her all the time. And she actually found it difficult living in Ireland for a while because she built a house in in a place called Dingle and it became part of the tourist kind of thing to be buses pulling up outside and taking photos. And so she actually, her husband, her ex-husband was from here and she moved here for a while then. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, So um, she liked to get away from it when when she wasn't working, if you want to call it that, she and um, because we'd get to go home and kind of live our lives as normal. Get we had the best of both worlds. We could just blend in and then come back and do this. For her, there was no escape on that side of it. Particularly when we were that big, um, it was she was always on, um, to the point that after the third album, we took a few years away from it because you can look back at that time and you see how thin she'd become. She just you know, she just wasn't well because of the stress from it all. And after a couple of years away, then she kind of settled back down again and kind of mm-hmm. realized that this is what she loved doing and she was going to do that. You know, she was she was open in her, uh, mm-hmm. about her mental health as well. You know, she was open <laughs> yeah. about, about bi- bipolar mm-hmm. disorder. Yeah. Fergal, when did you know that, when did you find out that Dol- Dolores was struggling with that too? Yeah, it was only really kind of around the same time that it was kind of made public that she started talking about it and kind of realized that was it. And, and you know, it, it kind of explained a lot that the erratic behaviour, I suppose, around that time, you know, and it was just, we were very supportive, really, you know, um, tried to help her out as much as possible and encourage her to right. get well. Because she was like, again, to me, she's a poster on the wall or she's a, she's a CD I own, but she mm. was, she was your buddy, I can only, yeah. you know? Yeah, she's yeah. like a little sister, you know, and there's a side to her that people don't know, I suppose, and it's the really funny, laughy, jokey kind of. Oh, tell me something, piss, tell like, me something know. about her. Um, yeah, <laughs> I suppose award ceremonies and things like that we were mm. talking about recently that we go to and people be so serious and trying to be cool and all that and, and she'd be just taking the piss going, look at this saving man over there. <laughs> <laughs> that kind of thing. Yeah. You know, once, it was funny, after she passed away, all those memories of early times came back when, when it was just like the four of us in the van together with a couple of friends and that's when we really got to know her properly, you know, when, when she wasn't so shy anymore, she became you know, a friend at that point, you know, when we'd be cracking jokes, because you're in a van for like six, seven hours driving around all these places and you have no choice but to get to know each other. It can get a little silly. 
Yeah, yeah. <laughs> for sure. Um, how was she doing the last time you saw her? Great, yeah. Yeah, she was actually really good. Um, she emailed the night before she passed away and she'd been t- talking about um, we were supposed to be going to China to do a few gigs and then go into the studio to do this album. So she was kind of looking towards the future. She just bought a house in, in outside Limerick that um, she was buying furniture for. So it was all looking to the future, you know, in a positive way. So same with you now? Yeah, yeah, I spoke with her the Friday before she passed away, like kind of most of the day was spent on and off on the phone with her. So we were discussing a lot of these songs and what the next process was. And I mean, that that made it that bit harder because when you're talking to someone and it's like, okay, we look at dates then for after China. And, you know, when you get the news, then you're kind of going, that doesn't make sense. It doesn't add up that somebody is talking about all this and suddenly they're not here anymore. Right, because you get the phone call and all You get the phone sudden. call and it's like, what? that's wrong, there's something mix up here. And that is genuinely what I thought for a while. I guess it was shock or whatever. Um, and it makes it a bit harder than when somebody's been through what she was and then can, comes out the other side of it and is in a really good place to suddenly have that cut as well then. Um, you know, she was in really good spirits on that Friday and she was out buying furniture for the new house on Saturday. So Heartbreaking. Yeah, I mean, I, 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 yeah, I, no. I know it's an understatement of the year. Yeah, you know, yeah. Right? I mean, it just—it's look. Anybody, we're not the only people who've ever lost somebody close to them. So you know, anyone who's been through it knows what it's like. It's just—it takes time. Even now, a year later, it's still kind of there's a lot of disbelief. Some days you kind of just can't believe it's happened. So, like, how are you feeling about promoting this record and having to talk about it so much and remember your buddy, like you to, to people, you know? Um. It's getting easier. I think we've been doing it a, a few months now. And I mean, we realized doing it that we were what we were taking on board, you know, that we were not only recording this album and putting it out there, but we would have to do this. But I mean, it's a lot of positive stuff we're talking about with her, you know, about how our lives were with her and these songs that she would be very, very proud of. Um, and again, I would hate to do the injustice of kind of just not doing this. And then the album come out and, you know, no one be aware of it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, thanks, guys. I mean, like, I, I know, um, again, like, to me, I'm, I'm sort of speaking peripherally or I'm speaking in a, in a kind of a grand intellectual way about Dolores and, and everything she meant to me and, and to people who worked on the show. But I know she was something else to you. So thanks for coming Thank in. Thank you. Thank you very much.